Hey there. Um, happy National Punctuation Day. Happy autumn. It's now officially autumn. We're moving into module two, which is exciting. I'll be getting the uh, poetry packet started grading in the next um, week. So thank you for your patience with that. And the module two folder, you'll see the module two assignment sheet. I have posted it as a Microsoft Word file if you want to download it to print it or, or save it. Um, and then just like in module one, I've po uh, pasted the, the text onto there. So you can also just see it right there in the folder. There's also the three packets that we will be reading for our blog post. I don't have the nonfiction essay assignment sheet or reading materials figured out yet. So um, this this genre of nonfiction. Nonfiction is a big umbrella, right? Your biology report is nonfiction. The newspaper article is supposed to be nonfiction. Um, autobiographies and biographies and memoirs and lyric essays and there's just a um, blog posts. There's a lot of different formats for nonfiction to happen in. What we're going to focus mostly on is um, the essay format and other ways of looking at creative nonfiction. So your biology lab report, not super exciting to read, right? It's just to convey information. But creative nonfiction employs the tools of poetry, of fiction, where we'll have figurative language, we'll have imagery, we'll have characterization and scene and dialogue. And that changes our relationship. Instead of it just being like a report, we as readers have a relationship with the content where we are more engaged, we're seeing it happen, we're feeling the emotions of, of the people involved. But in general, nonfiction is supposed to be true. So certain issues come up where, well, what's the difference between truth and fact? Sometimes things can be true but are non-factual. So if I'm reading a piece um, and they're, they're writing about, um, you know, a fist fight at a birthday party and they only acknowledge that five people were there because those are the five people involved in the fight. Well, maybe there was a cousin who was there but who wasn't involved so it's not important to know that the cousin was there so omitting mentioning and describing what the cousin was doing in the other room while the the fight was happening that's not completely factual but it's still true and that's kind of what I wanted to address in um, Joanne Beard's piece this is a very famous piece that we're reading this week the fourth state of matter and this is a braid so we have multiple stories that are being braided together. So we get the things about her dog and the things that happen at work. I won't spoil it if you haven't read it. And they're, they're braided back together, back and forth. And that creates um, a third opportunity for us. So we take the things about the dog and the things about what happened at work and and we put them together in a way that makes meaning. So truth versus fact is one of our controversies here. And um, what happens when somebody's telling a, a story about what happened when they were seven? Do they remember verbatim every single word exactly as it was said? And they, well, probably not. But if we write that out in scene and dialogue, I remember it happened in the kitchen and I remember some of the exact words Mama said, but I don't remember exactly everything. Uh, there's that, that controversy, that blurry area between taking creative license or taking multiple memories. So if I'm writing about, you know, me and my mom have argued about the same thing a hundred times and I want to kind of bring it all together and show it happening in the living room as one event, you know, this kind of uh, condensed memory. So that's a, um, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. Also the, the fickleness, the problem of memory. So how do these people remember exactly how it happened, the exact conversations? 
unless we have a photographic memory, we are um, inventing some of that in a way that is truthful, even if it's not factual. And think of how shady and shifty and problematic memory can be. It, you know, you forget things that people are like, no, we had this conversation. And you're like, no, we didn't. Or think about the things that we have forgotten. We could fill the world with things that we've forgotten just about our own life, certainly. So um, the other thing I want us to focus on, I'm trying to select our readers in all of these units to have diversity in readers. So, so much of the canon, if you pick up a literary anthology, all cisgender, white, Christian, Western dudes. Not what I want for this class. So I'm trying to select things that are um, showing the grand diversity in, in our literature. And that's why, you know, looking at Frank X. Walker, very famous Afrolatchian poet, he founded the Afrolatchian movement, um, saying, I'm black and Appalachian. We think of Appalachia as just being white people living in the mountains. Looking at Natalie Diaz, looking at Ada Limon. Um, and then this, for this unit, we're looking at women, we're looking at... Um, gay men, we're looking at transgender folks, we're looking at Indian women. One of the strongest things about nonfiction is that it opens up the opportunity to learn. So if I read Brent Staples' piece, A Black Man Ponders His Power to Alter Public Space, it's called Just Walk On By. It's a grand essay. I don't think I have it assigned for us. Um... I, in this lifetime, I have not been a six foot two black man. So reading his piece, telling me about his experience of what it's like to live in America in that body, I can learn. I can learn about his experience. I can learn about the experience of people who are unlike me. And also I can apply some of that to me about times people have changed their behavior because how they perceived me, the ways that people have stereotypes and prejudices against me. So that's, that's, I, I really love nonfiction. That's one reason why I really geek out about this is because out of all the experiences that are possible, we will have what? This tiny percentage of them. So in order to connect to humanity and to, to see what's possible, nonfiction and fiction and poetry allow that to happen, but especially nonfiction, if these things are true, that's a profound and powerful tool to break down barriers, to connect people across experience and across time. I was reading this book of um, a, a collection of letters this woman had written when Ohio was the frontier. That was the western frontier was Ohio. So we're talking you know, early 1800s. And it was a series of letters that she wrote back to her wealthy family in Maryland. And to see what her life was like, you know, her two-year-old baby sick and medical care at the time, they did bloodletting and purgatives. They gave this baby mercury so it, she would foam at the mouth because they thought that this was, oh my gosh. I have not had that experience. Um, the baby ended up okay, by the way. Um, it took her like six months to learn how to walk again because, well, mercury is a very powerful neurotoxin. It's not good. Um, creative nonfiction is an exceptionally powerful tool. And if we read about the lives of people who are not like us, I think prejudice, sexism, racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, fear, and misunderstanding would decrease. So I'm very excited to move into this unit with us. I'll have the rest of the materials posted as we move through this week. And I hope you have a great day.